I want to talk about wrestling with God and the way that I end up coming to some conclusions about things and some of the things that I've concluded as a result and the rather combative way in which I come to these conclusions. And so the reference is obviously to, in Genesis 32, Jacob wrestled a man till the break of day and uh, he refused to let go until he was blessed. And then it says in verse 28 that his name is no more called Jacob, but Israel. And um, in verse 30, he says that he's seen God face to face and his life is preserved. So it's a kind of combative way of obtaining something. There's, there was struggle there. He, he struggled to be blessed. And that's actually quite contrary to how it should be because you're already blessed and we are to stop struggling in order to obtain it. But I'm using the illustration because of the confrontational way that I often deal with God and what's being revealed to me. Um, and so going back as a child, I was fed a very Mount Sinai version of God who's angry and displeased all the time and ready to strike you dead. And ultimately, if you were to die at the wrong time, you'd be locked into never-ending, unrelenting pain and suffering without end. And that was just, as as I got old enough to start to think about that, probably somewhere around the age of 12 or 13, but I don't know exactly, I just realized how stupid and utterly blatantly wrong that was. That there's no way that there's a God who created everything and he hates what he's created. It just doesn't make any sense. And as I continue to explore and learn things, it called even further into question whether there was anything worthy to be called God at all. Now, at the age of 42, so approximately three full decades later, I ended up having a revelation of Jesus Christ that told me, okay, there is a God, and he's real, and he loves you. And so getting back around to, to how that came about, as, as a child, I had this incapacity to deal with adversarial situations. And so I would respond in a way that was unacceptable. And I was told, okay, that's not acceptable. You need to stop acting that way. And the thing is... I couldn't stop acting that way. So you have a child who's doing something unacceptable and wants to be accepted, but isn't accepted because his behavior is unacceptable. And he can't do anything to change that. So here I am, I'm in a situation where I can't deal with certain kinds of stresses in a way that's acceptable. And therefore, I'm just stuck being unaccepted. You know, and then on, then piled on top of that is this Mount Sinai version of God who doesn't accept you. Well, that's just not going to work. Um, and so that probably was a major contributing factor there. But the thing is... So you have this component of my personality, that I am somebody that I don't want to be, and nobody else wants me to be either. And so, when you say that people have free will, I say bullshit. When you say that people can change, if you just put the effort into it, I say fuck you. And <laughs> I know that's rather uh, offensive to phrase it that way 
but I think free will is bullshit. Because if free will was real, I wouldn't have plunged so deep into suicidal despair over a characteristic trait that I could do absolutely, positively nothing to change. And believe me, I put a lot of effort into changing that about myself, and to this day, it has yet to change. Right now, this very moment, that characteristic about me is still there. More recently, uh, up to a few years ago, I put a great deal of effort into things such as cognitive behavioral therapy, affirmations. Um, I mean, I took it to the level of straight up brainwashing where I was, I made audio tracks with different affirmations and things and I would listen to them in my sleep during as many waking hours as I could. I mean, if if it could be done, if it was one of those things that was out there in terms of self-help religion, I tried it. I did it. Uh, medications just had horrible effects on me that made me feel worse. Um, so there's this aspect about myself that if you want, you know, my attitude was basically I never consented to being born, never asked to be here. I certainly didn't get to choose what kind of person I'm like. And not only did I not get to choose my beginning circumstances, I can't change them. So, all that leads to is despair. To be in a state where there's something about yourself that's wrong, and everybody agrees that it's wrong. And there's nothing you can do about it. And then you're told... That if there is a God, he hates you. And he wants you to be anybody but who you are. If you want to talk about having an agreement with God that you suck as a human being and you're a complete and total failure. Well, I spent my whole life doing that. That is not a part of the gospel message. So we go to the garden, and the lie is the same lie that's constantly told all throughout everything that pervades all of society. And when the Bible speaks of being like the world, this is what it's talking about. Because the lie in the garden was that there's something about you that isn't right, and you need to fix it yourself. Because God doesn't want to do it for you. And so, the serpent told Eve that there was something lacking. Something that God didn't do for her. Something that God didn't give to her. Something that God didn't want her to have. Something that God had abandoned her and that it was up to her to fix it so that she could be made whole and complete. But God had proclaimed everything very good with man and woman both made in the likeness and image of God. So this was a lie that they had to do anything. And the lie is that they had to do anything. Adam named the animals. This is like a, this is like a parent who has a small child and needs to get some work done, and the child wants to help, and the child is too small and not experienced enough to be of any actual assistance. So the father looks around, sees some toys, and says, I want you to tell me about who these, these are. And so when you have your story and you have, are ready to tell me about who all these toys are, I want you to tell me. So the child contributes absolutely nothing to the work being done. But the father, when the child comes and says, here's what I have to say about these things. 
The father is absolutely delighted. The fellowship that he has with his child is just wonderful. The child actually contributed nothing whatsoever to productivity, to accomplishing anything, but he contributed everything to the satisfaction of the father. And this is who God is. God said, Adam, I want you to name the animals because that would absolutely delight me for you to decide what these things are called. And I want you to come back to me and tell me in wonderful stories about what those names mean and why they came to you. Why are you calling it that? And so in the garden, they're told, well, first of all, they're actually told to enjoy life. Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, eat from every tree of the garden, but don't think there's anything that you need to do to earn my favor or to be made complete because you're already made in the likeness and image of who I am. So Eve was made to believe that there's something that you need to do to be made complete. And this is consumerism. If only I had a better phone. If only I had a better job. Then, then, then things would be great. If only I made more money. Then, then I would be fulfilled. You know, if only I lived in a better town. Then things would be, then, then things would be good. If only I had a more understanding spouse. Then I could be happy. You know, whatever it is, there's always some. If only I had. And Paul said that he learned to be happy whether he's abased or whether he's abounding. And that's really what the, the key is, is to, to understand, to look at things where there's nothing lacking. So when I had my revelation of Jesus, I had this vision and I saw him hanging on a cross and I felt this love like I'd never felt before. And by the way, I was planning on terminating my life, which is something that I had actually been hospitalized multiple times, including the very day of my 40th birthday was spent in a psychiatric ward. Um, and so it was at this time that I was really going to do it. I was really just so utterly in despair that who I am will always be who I am and I will always be unacceptable and I can't do anything to change it and I don't want to do anything to go on anymore waking up being me I can't take it anymore I hate being me and I can't change it and every day I would wake up and I would wake up and say, God damn it. Because it was yet another day that I was still alive and I was still me. And nothing could be worse than that. So it was at this time and I start having a vision and I see Jesus on the cross. And the more I tried to shake this vision and say, no, this is not happening. You're not real. You're a mythological figure. I want nothing to do with you. But I could feel this love. It was just unimaginably intense. And the vision wasn't going away. And so, I decided that what I was feeling could only be described as God. And so what I was experiencing was God revealing himself to me. And what he revealed to me was himself hanging on a cross. And I said, I regret that I wasn't able to help nail you to that thing. I am not only furious that I was ever born, but I'm furious that I was born when I was because I want to put them nails in deeper. 
I want to make sure you're stuck on there. This is the clean version of how things happen, by the way. So, as I continued to vent, he just looked at me. And I paused, and he said, When you're finished, I love you. So, my view of what the cross is all about is that God could do nothing higher to show us that he's not this Mount Sinai version of God than to let us kill him and in that moment say, if you're finished, I love you. So, I see everything through a lens where God is the happiest, most loving, most tolerant being in the universe. And the lie of the garden is that I need to do something to earn that and to be made complete. And what God is saying is, you're already perfect. It's already very good. And so we believe this lie that we're less than perfect. And I remember one time, and I can't attribute it, and I don't know what the source is or if it was quoting anybody or whatever. I just know that it was an atheist somewhere, somehow, in some forum or comments thread somewhere, who said, God rested on the seventh day. Well, he should have done a little bit of fine-tuning. And that's the lie in the garden. The lie in the garden is that God's not finished. The lie in the garden is that there's something left to us to finish and to fix in the fine tune. But more than that, it shows how we have our view that God says is very good and takes the day off and proclaims that he's done. And we say, no, God. You need to fix this. You need to do some more work. You need to... We don't like what you made. I don't like who you made me as. I hate who I am. And God says, But it's perfect. Everything that I made is perfect, exactly the way that I want it to be. And so the mind of Christ is that it's perfect and finished. And the mind of man says, no, it's not. You need to fix this. Or I need to fix it. Somebody needs to fix it. So I came to the revelation that a contrast between man's thinking and God's thinking is that God says, it's very good and I am done. And man says, no, you need to do some fine-tuning. So this brings us to end times. Because I struggled with this, and I had another nice knock-down, drag-out fight with God. And I said, one time, looking at a position that says, it is, you know, when Jesus said it is finished, it's finished. And that we're in new heavens and new earth. And I said, no. That's wrong. There's more work to be done. 
there's fine-tuning to be done. And suddenly I heard this intrusive thought. Say, but what did you say about the garden and creation and Genesis 1? And I said, you said it was perfect, very good, and it was done. And God says, and what's your complaint? And I said, it's not. You need to do some fine-tuning. And he said, so that's why you won't accept that we're in New Jerusalem, that we're in New Heavens and New Earth. Because you think it needs to be fixed. But I said, I'm done, and it's very good. And I said, it is finished. So, I did not want to accept this. But it just kept haunting me and challenging me. And God never said that there's some requirement to accept this. He just kept asking. What happened in the beginning? You made everything. You said it was perfect. You said you were done. And you said at the cross it is finished. And, and I think it's not. And so who's wrong? What's the mind of man? What's the mind of Christ? The mind of Christ is to come into agreement with God. And God's not believing that he made something faulty, including a boy who can't respond to adversity properly and who people find to be unacceptable. So, that's how I ended up coming to the conclusion that we're in New Jerusalem. It's already here. It's already happened. And this is not something that just came to me this week. It's something I've actually been fighting for more than a year. And I've been accepting it for nearly that amount of time. But it's really something that's hard to deal with. Always agreeing with the mind of Christ that things are as they should be. Not that everything in its detail is as it should be, but rather that God is not displeased and waiting to come back and kill everybody and destroy everything and wipe it all out and start over again. Because the cause of th everything that isn't as it should be is our failure to accept that the kingdom of God is here now and that we're already inheritors and that we are already in the body of Christ and in I forget if it's first or second Peter but he lists off a bunch of things that basically you could call it fruit of the Spirit. And he says, if you don't have it, it's because you've forgotten that you were forgiven of all your sins. And James says something about being like a man looking in a mirror who then turns around and forgets what sort of man you are. And that's why you don't do the works of God. So here's two separate witnesses saying the reason you're not acting like a child of God is because you've forgotten how God sees you. And maybe it's not that we've forgotten. Maybe it's that we've rejected it. 
or maybe it's just that we're not feeling it at the moment. It doesn't really matter. The point is that our mind is not in the mind of Christ, where we're seeing ourselves for who we are and how God sees us, because we're seeing ourselves as we see us, as unacceptable, as needing work, as needing to change and be something different, as being other than who we're supposed to be, as being other than who God wants us to be. And so when Jesus came to be Savior of the world, what he came to do was to correct a faulty image of an angry, displeased God who plans to ruin everything and start over. And what he showed us was a God who's utterly pleased with what he's made, even though we're not.